Hey, dude. How's it going? Good. Going good. I'm, I'm headed to Saudi Arabia tomorrow, actually. Okay. So I've been like trying to figure out where I'm going, and I saw something that I want to show you. Saudi Arabia, big giant desert, giant dunes that go on forever over here, mountains and red rock over here, and then just right smack dab in the middle of it, these farms. Circles upon circles upon circles. This stuff goes on for miles, just everywhere you look. So you're gonna be driving right by these when you go. Dude, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. That's why I found it. It's like, I'm gonna be driving right past all of this stuff. I do not know much about Saudi Arabia, but this is clashing with a lot of what I thought I knew about this place. Yeah, yeah, me too. There's something juicy here. As soon as Johnny showed me this place, I was hooked. So we teamed up with Johnny on the ground. Dude, Christoph, I found another one. And me on the internet. How is that possible? Trying to figure something out. What are all of these crop fields doing in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert? And where are they getting all of the water to do this? Okay, um, where do I start? The farms that Johnny showed me are all circular fields. So that means that they are center pivot irrigation. Basically a sprinkler sits in the middle of a field and rotates around to, to irrigate all of the crops. I wanna see if I can find more of them. So all across the country, you have these areas that are kind of speckled with these little circular farms. Some of them are like right next to these huge expanses of dunes. But what's really catching my eye are these. I can use Google Maps' measure distance tool to sort of get a really rough perimeter of how big these things are. I'm not doing this very well. So just that chunk is almost 3,000 square kilometers. It's over 1,000 square miles. The total land area of like Manhattan is 23 square miles, and this is 1,000 square miles. How is that possible? So these farms cover like 46 Manhattans. That's just this section. There are a lot more fields. Obviously these things are big, but when you see so many of them one next to the other, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that. I wonder how long these have been there. Let's start taking some screenshots. These time lapses are fascinating to watch. I mean, all across the country, you have like these explosions of green. Historical imagery on Google Earth only goes back to 1984. So you have places where like within 30 years, they go from this to that. I mean, it feels insanely fast. It's like 30 years is a lot of time, but when you see it like this, I mean, it just feels like really rapid, rapid expansion. What's baffling is like the fact that this is all happening in a desert. I mean, of all places, this just feels like the most unlikely place for an agricultural operation. Oh, okay. It seems like Johnny has actually made it to Saudi Arabia. Okay, here we go. Hey, Salam, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. You ready to go in the desert? You can definitely tell that this is a farming town. Like I'm just at a pit stop here. Lots of trucks with hay in the back. I assume that's what's being grown in these circles. A couple nice looking camels in the back of this truck. Okay, really quick. While Johnny was in Saudi Arabia, I spent a lot of time speed reading articles and watching news videos and trying to understand this complex topic a lot better. But when you're navigating global coverage, you inevitably come across outlets that you're not that familiar with, with varying degrees of bias. And that's where Ground News comes in. They're an app and a website that gathers stories from all over the world in one place with a clear visual breakdown of the outlet's location, bias, reliability, and even their ownership. And if you're wondering, okay, how do they assess that bias? They're all backed up by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. As I'm editing this video, 
video, Saudi Arabia is hosting UN talks on drought and desertification. One of the big stories from those talks is a report that over 75% of the land on Earth has become permanently drier in the last 30 years. It's a really big story. Over 90 outlets are covering it, but depending on where you read your news, the framing can really differ. Some of the headlines are really solutions-oriented, like Le Monde, a left-leaning French newspaper, highlighted nature-based solutions to halt land degradation. Other headlines are more alarming, like this one from IFL Science, highlighting that this is an existential threat affecting billions. And then there's this left-leaning outlet from Spain reporting that arid lands do not stop conquering planet. And Spain is one of the victims. Always find the local angle. Seeing coverage like this from all over the world helps make sure that I don't miss any critical developments that US-based outlets might not be talking about. I like to poke around this one feature called the Blind Spot feed. It highlights stories that are specifically undercovered by either right-leaning outlets or left-leaning outlets. I honestly think it's a good antidote to a world where our news feeds are so algorithmically personalized. You can see stories that might not be getting past your filter bubble and also what kinds of stories aren't getting past other people's. It's all about making consuming news a more transparent experience. Now's the perfect time to try ground news. There having their biggest sale of the year. It's a great gift for any news nerds that you might know. You can get 50% off unlimited access to the Vantage plan at ground.news slash tunnelvision. I highly recommend checking it out. The more I looked at these fields from above, the more they felt like the most impossible farms on the planet. I wanted to figure out, with no rivers and only a tiny amount of rainfall, how did anything grow here at all? So I looked for articles about Saudi Arabian agriculture. I started reading, and one byline kept coming up. Fred Pierce. He's a science writer who's written dozens of books about environmental issues. So I sent him an email, set up an interview, and called him. It's a desert region. You wouldn't expect there to be water there, but there is huge amounts of water underground um, in porous rocks, simply because in past climates, it was a lot wetter there. Fred told me this is called fossil groundwater, leftover from the last ice age. The water is trapped more than a mile underneath the sand, in porous sandstone and limestone, but it can be drilled and pumped to the surface. And that's very much a one-off operation. You can only do it once because with no rainfall or very little rainfall, that water is simply not coming back. You're mining water, essentially. So drilling ancient groundwater, that's how they did it. But this is a rich country that could just import all of its food. Why do all of this to grow their own in the first place? The Saudis were aware that they, while they were making large amounts of money out of their oil, they were making enemies. With oil prices at an all-time high, they had pots of cash, and they simply started throwing that money into putting in pumps. So farming the desert was the insurance plan to any future threat to their food supply. The Saudis value their independence, and most important, they can afford it. You want to go out and provide the best of everything for your citizens. That's what money is really for. The agricultural program has been dubbed the greening of the desert. Those giant farms focused predominantly on one crop, wheat. Saudi Arabia spent hundreds of billions of dollars of oil revenue to do three things. Completely subsidize water, largely subsidize the electricity it took to pump that water, and pay farmers multiple times the international price for wheat. If none of that sounds sustainable or efficient to you, that's because it wasn't. There were literally no incentives for farmers to use uh, water efficiently. Water was effectively a free resource, even in the desert. But money was no object for the Saudis. And I think the government felt they wanted to be self-sufficient in food as far as they could. At its peak in the early 1990s, Saudi Arabia was one of the top exporters of wheat in the world. That system obviously couldn't last forever. The problem is that even though the groundwater underneath Saudi Arabia was vast, one of the world's largest underground water stores, within 20 years, they'd pump most of it out. When Saudi Arabia started pumping water for agriculture in the 1980s, there were an estimated 500 billion cubic meters of water under the Saudi desert. It's enough water to fill Lake Erie. But virtually none of that groundwater was replaced by rain. Now experts estimate that Saudi Arabia has drained roughly 80% of its groundwater. So groundwater that had accumulated over thousands and thousands of years was mostly emptied in one generation. This kind of groundwater depletion is an issue all over the world. A 2015 study found that a third of the world's freshwater aquifers were being emptied by human consumption much faster than they were being naturally refilled. And on that list, Saudi Arabia's aquifer was the most overstressed in the world. What I couldn't stop thinking about was, if they can't keep this up forever, then what happens to all of these fields? Three days into Johnny's trip on the ground, he found some answers. Uh. 
Here they are. To be clear, we are in a desert. <laughs> desert. Brown. Green. Like, as far as the eye can see, desert. And then this pop of intense green. It's so subtle from down here. Let's see what the drone says. Okay, she's up in the air. Let's see what we see here. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. Like they were mesmerizing on the map, but they're even more mesmerizing in real life. Holy shit. And if you zoom out and look into the distance, you see them everywhere. Wow. You can see how some of these are totally brown. Like, there's just the ghost of those circles that I remember seeing on the map, and now I see them as just sort of deserted farms, just receded back to the desert. Or is that God, did he search it? When Johnny first sent over this footage, that part caught my attention. Brown fields receding back into the desert. I had missed this in the time lapses, but you could see it there too. For years, the farms expanded and expanded until suddenly fields started to turn brown. A NASA blog post about Saudi agriculture explained that these brown fields are fallow, which means that they've been left bare with no crops. You can see that there's still plenty of active fields. Those are still irrigated with pumped groundwater. But every year, there are fewer and fewer. It looks like evidence of Saudi Arabia pulling back from agriculture. And now I needed to understand when did that change happen and why? So I used a tool on the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization site. And when you look at Saudi Arabia's total production of wheat, you can see where those farms really start to take off. But you can also see where that growth stops soon after. In chart after chart, you see the same dip right after 1990 in agricultural output, in land dedicated to agriculture, and in how much water was being pumped out of aquifers. The same steep decline across every metric. Maybe figuring out what happened right there would be a clue. I looked for academics who had studied Saudi Arabia's agriculture and water, and I found Mohammed Sahail. In 2024, he led a study about Saudi Arabia's water resources. What exactly happened in the early 90s that leads to that really sharp decrease? So the uh, demand for water was increased drastically up to 1995. But after this, there was a, a basically one important event in the Global Earth Summit in 1992. That's the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, where representatives from 179 countries discussed the impact of human economic activities on the environment. So after uh, this Earth Summit, the government realized that we are just running out of the water, so we must realize the value and use it efficiently. So that is why they just stopped uh, cultivation of wheat, because it was a major water-consuming crop. So reason number one behind this downturn was just phasing out wheat one particularly large consumer of water. And also the second reason was that uh, the Saudi Arabia adopted a new model to purchase or uh, the lease land uh, in other countries. So these farms going brown wasn't evidence of this country giving up on its dream of food security. It was just evidence of it pivoting to a different strategy. Starting in 2007, there was a huge spike in the cost of food around the world. And in response, Saudi Arabia launched the Initiative for Saudi Agricultural Investment Abroad, a plan to encourage buying farmland abroad, growing crops there, and shipping the crops back to Saudi Arabia, with subsidies for irrigation systems and seed buying and machinery for those farms. I found a site called Land Matrix. It's an independent project that publishes data on large-scale land acquisitions. And on it, you can see that Saudi Arabia has made land purchases in at least 10 countries, most of them in Africa. And Saudi Arabia isn't alone. This web shows every land acquisition deal between countries. Around the globe, rich countries worried about one day not having enough water or farmland are seeking out poorer countries with water and farmland to spare. 
and either buying up that land or leasing it in long-term contracts to turn it into farms of their own. These kinds of farmland purchases have increased drastically in the last two decades. On one hand, these deals can be an infusion of cash for developing countries that can lead to economic development. But on the other hand, they can mean that those countries lose access to water and to land that they might need one day to feed their own people. Critics say that these large-scale land acquisitions are a modern-day land grab that have stoked displacement and environmental degradation and even violence for the people who live there. These circular farms told a dramatic story. They're the remains of an experiment, an experiment that started in the desert lands of a wealthy country and devastated its water resources before spreading to the fertile land of less wealthy countries. Saudi Arabia's experiment is the most dramatic of its kind today, but it might not be forever. While the Saudis have pumped the water out faster than most places, they're certainly by no means alone, and most underground water reserves around the world are being overpumped today. Like with the rest of us, the long-term considerations tend to go on the back burner. Everybody's realizing that there's a limit on how much we've, we've got on this planet to exploit. 